Construction champions, it's your host Ron Newsbaum, and we're here for another amazing episode of Construction Champions Podcast. We were burning the house down twice a week, every Monday and Thursday, and we're not just burning it down to burn it down. So don't everybody get all up in a fuss. We're burning it down so we can rebuild it, and that doesn't mean, like I've said before, but it's probably been six months since I said that. Said this. Is if a project goes south, don't go burn it down and then be like Ron Newsbaum was like, we're burning it down. That's not what we're doing here. We're burning down the business and the thoughts around the mindset of the construction industry. That's what we're doing. And then we're rebuilding them with that championship cowpo, that next level. That's what we're doing here on Construction Champions. And as always, I'm super fired up for today's guest. Paul, it is great to have you here today. Hey, thanks so much for having me. Great intro, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's always a work in progress. You would think like 150 episodes, I would have this shit figured out at some point in time, but it just I just roll with it. And I just, I just try to have fun, bring excitement, because I think that's what the industry deserves out of us. So like I said, I'm excited for today's conversation. But before we dive in there, why don't you tell all the construction champions out there a little bit about yourself? What got you here to today? Yeah, sure. I'll I'll try and do a fairly uh, succinct um, version of my bio. But uh, so I started off. Um, I started off doing like landscape trades when I was in my youth. That's how I paid for my college, and that's that's what I I I did kind of growing up. And then when I graduated. I started a software company up that really focused on landscape trades, but also we had we had like irrigation and plumbers, electricians, more on the, the server side rather than the construction side, um, and and built up that software company up over ten years and and sold it to a private equity company, uh, and then from that point we the, the remaining team um, we we started another software company up called called method and um method had a different take on it it was more uh horizontal like it serves many different businesses uh we do have a lot of construction trades using the software for for various purposes which is i guess what we're talking today um uh, but also maybe maybe notable as well i i just finished building our own custom house ourselves uh, and, uh, of course worked with the builder and worked with a lot of trades directly. So I had firsthand experience of, of what it's like, at least in Toronto, where we are with the, with the landscape and sort of the construction trades are, uh, are doing from day to day and maybe why some of them use, use our software to solve those problems. Awesome, man. Well, I love it. I always, I always love when I have people on here that got their start around here, even though they might not work in construction today but like we can all remember back when we were cutting our teeth just growing up like doing that and i I always love when we have guests on here that talk about that so paul i'm going to dive right in and i'm going to ask you the million dollar question and that is what makes a construction champion i think what makes us a construction champion is one that makes like, any small business champion and that is are you running a tight ship with like zero friction on your mind mm. that that to me is the business that i want to run when i run my businesses and i think every construction trade if they're looking at looking for championship they should be thinking about scaling with zero friction i love that cuz i mean that is Definitely how we should be looking at it. But I think in the construction industry, we just kind of accept friction as an unavoidable when that's not 100% true. Yeah, the, the friction I'm thinking of is more in process, right? Like like things are going to go wrong for sure. But there's 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 interactions between, between staff within the same company, uh, interactions between the, the trades and the builder, interactions directly with the customer. And uh, all those interactions are kind of governed by workflows. And I think of a workflow being really a, a set of sequential steps to complete a task. And like, if you think of it, we're, there's so many workflows we go through every single day, 
like yes in business but even in personal life i i get up in the morning one of the first things i do is i make a coffee uh and the way i make my coffee is i turn the machine on i clean out the filters uh my rinse a couple times if it's been a bad night i might have two scoops of espresso grinds in my espresso and and i'll go i'll go through various steps to make my coffee and that's how uh, I define my workflow, but if I do the same thing every single day, then that is a like a, a standard procedure of my workflow. And the same thing happens in business, whether it's how I give a quote, how I take a deposit, how I notify a change to a builder, uh, how I answer the phone call. And so these are all workflows that govern how I build my business as a, as a construction trade. Um, and as I scale and I'm having other people do those for me, answering emails, answering phone calls, giving out quotes, communicating to the builders, are they doing the same way as me or is it just the Wild West? And then that's the kind of friction I'm talking about is, is can you reduce the friction between all those interactions of internal and external stakeholders? Yeah, no, and I, I love the Wired West because that's a lot of time how we look at it. Like, unfortunately, it's like, oh, this is construction. It's the Wired West. And I, I would agree on your side of things is that you can start to take those frictions out. I've done it before like that. Everything you do is a process or a system. We just necessarily don't have the discipline a lot of times to actually create it how it should be. Like we just, this is how we do it, but we don't really want to say this is how we do it because if we commit to that, we then have to be disciplined to do it that way every time. Very few people write it down. Let's just start there. <laughs> <laughs> actually, I would even say very few people are even aware of how they do it. If you actually ask them to write down how they made their coffee in the morning, they might even pause and think like, how do I make my coffee and it's probably the same way every single day but it, to actually sit down and write that those steps down is the first step uh, and and i think that is what's called a, a standard operating procedure so if you could do that if you could write down standard operating procedures for everything you do in your business you're at you're at square one and there's there's steps you go through after that <laughs> but that's the first thing to do yeah, I don't. So for if anybody wants to know how I make my coffee is after I get done with dinner and we do the dishes, I clean the coffee pot. We put I put spring water in there and I put our coffee in there and I hit the button twice. And at 630 in the morning, it automatically makes itself. So when I walk downstairs, the coffee's already ready. But I, right. I, I love how you put like that. That's just stand like that's part of kind of like my routine like that's just what it is because I, I like I try to be very structured but I've, I've never written it down on like this is what just how I do my life every day now imagine you go from your current household to like 10 people living in your house and then you no longer have time to make coffee anymore and you got to figure out how to get other people making that that for you that's when you got to figure out like how to write it down how to how to standardize it. I think when, when small businesses start off uh, and that construction trades are no different, they, hopefully they're not using pen and paper. I know it's 2024. I think we want to believe that no one's using pen and paper anymore when they start off, but they probably are. Um, I don't think you can be a construction champion if you don't have an eye on systems. So hopefully they're using at least some kind of software like Google Sheets or um, uh, or a spreadsheet of some type. And and, that, and that's probably the first step where they're putting systems in, in place. Then they are probably using accounting software. That's probably the next step for them. Uh, and that's in North America, that's almost always QuickBooks, but it could be a little company in New Zealand called Zero. They're, they're coming on strong. Um, but then usually when you hit around 10 people, that's when you need real systems because that's when you start losing control. And these real systems do some of this automation for you that um, are automating some of the steps that you, you've been doing manually all this time using Excel for. And I think that's where it gets hard for the small businesses is around 10. 
because then you got to tell someone else how to make the coffee in the morning. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I have firsthand experience with what you're talking about, just because seventy percent of all users were the first technology they're implementing in their business, literally pen and pen. Like I mean, and I, I I don't just deal with like newer contractors and builders as well. I deal with people who have been in the industry for 20, 25 years are like, yeah, 2024, it's now the time to start implementing technology. And there's a learning curve there that I think we don't don't necessarily think about when we like what you're talking about is like a, some people don't have anything written down and then they're going to do something. And it's a, it's a job. Like you have to start with what you say, like you have to have an understanding of how you do it before you can do anything else. Yeah, I think technology is the step three. So step one is writing it down, being aware and writing it down. Step two is figuring out which ones of those could you automate and which ones can you just delegate? Like you could be probably a, a champion company, at least at 10 people, if you were able to delegate and have, have the same processes done in the same way every single time. When you when you start automating, though, and you're bringing in software to, to do some of these procedures that, that make sense to automate, then technology is, is your best friend. You just got to be really careful what you do. You can't automate everything. Like if you can, a so, so amen, yeah. amen. It's, to it's, that. it's not, it's not possible. You got to figure out which things to automate. And uh, there's a few, there's a few indicators to look for. One is, is there a key person doing it? Is it the head of the house is making the coffee in the morning? Like, it, 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 if if it is, maybe that's a bottleneck for the whole company to grow. Uh, two, does it touch external stakeholders? So is it touching customers? Are they seeing? The friction or is it kind of embedded in the way because ones that are touching customers or, or or builders partners uh those might get more automation attention the others that are more internal uh is it something that is takes a long time like if it takes an takes an hour is that worth automating well maybe only if it's if it's if it's regular if it's not regular it's only once a month maybe an hour is not worth automating so you got to think about the frequency as well um I think those are probably probably the key ones. The the last one would be is it non-critical thinking. So it does it require a brain? If it requires a brain, you probably don't want to automate it right away. Let let humans do what they're good at, which is think some critical thinking and automate everything else away. So once you've figured out those like the 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 tasks to automate, and there's only a few of them to start off with, then you can start figuring out what software to use. I absolutely love what you're saying because I, I hear too often guys are just like, I'm just going to get it all automated. Like AI, all of this stuff, we're just yeah. we're going to be able to automate the entire business. Now, I mean, I believe in the power of all of this, but like you're saying, you just don't turn a switch and automate your entire business unless you want to just really blow something up really quickly or break it really quickly. Like it takes... It takes steps. So you like you said, software is like probably step three, but then there's there's different levers to all of this. It's just like anything you do, there's different levers, and you have to start somewhere, start to figure it out, become comfortable with it, and figure out where else it works in your business. You just can't throw it, you just can't throw everything at it and just be like, hey, here we go. We don't have to do any of this because it's just happening now. Yeah, I, I say start small, find the biggest problem to automate. Um, yeah, I think of this um, this one one customer we had who said, listen, all I want to use your software for, I know it does lots of things, but I just want to help it create estimates. We're a $3 million business, and I'm still making all the estimates myself. And the reason why I'm doing that is because it's so complicated. Um, it, it was, uh, they, construct, they constructed some kind of um, uh, shelving system where the, the the custom shelves could only be uh, fit into, into certain types of configurations, and he knew what all the configurations were, um, and he couldn't he couldn't just give this Excel spreadsheet so, spreadsheet to someone else to do. So he knew all the custom configurations of the sheet, and he knew what with what, 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 what. So he's a three million dollar business, and he's still doing all the estimates. Mm. 
So he said, all, all I want from you guys is to make a custom estimate process uh, and then have the estimate flow back into QuickBooks for me. And that's all I want. I don't want nothing else. And that saved him a huge amount of time because it wasn't him doing estimates anymore. Anyone in this company could make an estimate and, and dummy proof. Just pick one thing like this guy did. And then that also made his business scalable at that point. Yeah. And like, I can't know, $3 million and you're the only one that can write an estimate. Like that's, you want to talk about the definition of being the roadblock. I'm glad. I mean, that was some championship thinking to come find you and be like, I, the, I need a dummy proof system here. So anybody can do this. Yeah. He was a champion for coming out and, and asking, uh, I think he, in, in retrospect, wished he had thought about it earlier because he had reached a point where he was losing business because of it. His business had actually plateaued. I think he'd been at 3 million for two years in a row mm. after growing, growing, growing. And so his reflection was, I should have done this earlier, but still like he, he automated, um, use software to do it and then kept growing past that. So, so good on him. Yes. I would consider him a, a construction champion. Well, hindsight's <laughs> twenty twenty. You know, it's uh, all all we can really do. But I mean, that we all have it. Like for all the all the champions out there listening right now, like what's that thing in your business that you are the roadblock on right now? Like there's something, and you know it because it's probably what keeps you up at night. Yeah, I think that yeah, the other common one is deposits. I, I think uh, the the whole process of of accepting a, a deposit and getting paid a deposit tends to be a big problem we hear from construction trades, especially really? when they're dealing directly with residential. Really? What, I mean, what would, what is, I, if we want, if you don't mind diving into that a little bit, cause I don't. But you don't I'd see like, that? No. It's, it's actually, so I, I know that as someone who was on the receiving end of deposits, I could see why it was painful, but it is actually the number one thing construction trades come to us for. Um, it's because so many of them are still not automated. They're like, we're getting PDFs uh, of, a, of a written deposit <laughs> email, right? It's like, okay, so you receive this deposit uh, request. Now, how do you get money to them? Like, you got to call up and say, come by the house and pick up a check. Uh, you can't, if you're not available to do it, like you this kind of sits there stagnant. You can't, you can't hand the money over. I can see why they, large sums of money in, in the trades, you don't want to take a credit card and lose that 3% or whatever it is. Um, so I can see why they haven't set up online um, uh, credit card receiving for the deposits. But um, like what we see a lot of is the ability to create a an estimate, send it out, get a 50% deposit electronically, um, receive ACH, electronic check rather than credit card it's a very small fees there um any change orders that happen as a request be reflected online through an online portal and then um and then have that, that payment coming through much earlier than having to go back and forth and sending paper checks <laughs> so, so that's so that's that's we see a lot of that uh maybe no i don't think it's local to like the Toronto region, because a lot of our customers, most of our customers are in the U S so it's a, it's a, it's a problem we see a lot. Yeah, no, I mean, I can see that. I dealt in a lot of check transactions or credit card transactions and stuff. I can see where if you don't have a system in place, how you could be doing a lot of running around. Like if you have a, if you don't have a way for them to easily just pay or just let them know you could spend a lot of time running around. Yeah. And that's friction. You know, before I start off saying like zero friction, that's the stuff personally, I just want to always eradicate. Like if a customer wants to give you money, make that so easy. <laughs> <laughs> if they want to accept your proposal and have a signature, make that so easy. Don't like, don't make it so that you you or your staff to go and drive out there and like, and accept it it's in or organize a time to meet that's just friction in today's age i would so, say especially in 2024 like if you can't get a proposal signed and collect the deposit without having to go out there you need to be rethinking how you're doing this 
because like you said, that's creating a pain point, not just for your business, but for your customer as well. That's right. If you're dealing directly with a customer, if you're dealing directly with a builder, then you have like different things you probably want to automate, right? Like, like a lot of, a lot of the quotes will come from the builder and then it'll get moved over to the residential customer for direct. And you want to keep that link to the builders, you know, what, what, what work is coming from builders and there's no field in, in QuickBooks, your accounting software that, that tracks that and reports on that. So that's another area you might want to, uh, automate a little bit better, but, um, yeah, for, for for us, a lot of the work around deposits and hmm. receiving that initial deposit is uh, what what people focus on as the most important thing to solve right away. Well, I mean, I can see that. I can see why getting the money through the door to get the project started might be priority number one when you're trying to automate your systems, because uh, nothing starts without that. Yeah. Well, it's like that, that estimate guy I was telling you before, it's one of those areas that the key person in the business is probably still doing because they're, you're not going to send the secretary out to go in the truck to go pick up the, the quotes. So you're still doing it and you're killing, you're killing the business. So um, I mean, hopefully, I think if you're listening to Ron's podcast, you're probably a level up. You're, you're, well, I mean, you're thinking about all, these things can, and, and maybe this is not your problem <laughs> we can only I hope so well, but i mean what but what it is <laughs> is it shines eye bars on what friction points are like we talk about this me and you can have a conversation about what is friction what causes these problems but using an example that's so obvious to what you're saying is now guys can go and say okay that is friction. Where do I have that in my business? I might not have it with deposits or getting the contract signed, but where is something that 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 same pain points happening for either myself, the company, the customer, the builders I work with, the subcontract? Like, where does that happen? Because now they have a clear understanding on what we're talking about when we talk about friction and processes. Yeah. Uh, the where where are all the slip ups happening like are you are you are you slipping up on warranty information are you, are you like is, there, is everyone always asking you questions about hey when's this warranty uh set for i guess it depends on state to state um but i know that uh most states have some kind of home warranty system that they have to adhere to for a, a year or two years depending on the type of trade that it is and where do you track that do you, do you track that separately on a, a whiteboard in the office? Hopefully not. Is it an Excel file? Is it attached to your accounting software? Or is it in, in your industry specific software, your trade software that you have? Uh, if you don't, then you're probably having things fall between the, the cracks. And it's either friction for your customer or it's friction for you because you missed a deadline. Yeah, no. And you know, for guys out there listening, if you're like, you can't quite like you're you're beating your head kind of against the wall like you know i had you know, like i have this stuff but i don't know what it is so what i used to do uh was i just ca i had a book that i always had with me no matter what meeting wherever i did and anything where i was getting questions asked to me or it was kind of an escalated situation i would always write that stuff down and i keep a weekly run on like these are the question that's questions i'm being asked and see if I could spot any trends in any of it. Because if you start to spot those trends in what people are acquiring, whether it's your staff, customers, leadership, any 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 conversations that you're having, if you start to sp start to spot those trends, you're probably on to where the friction's at around yourself or within your company. If you're here, if you're going to job sites and you're hearing the same thing. You never know it unless you stop writing this stuff down. Like if you don't start writing down what people are asking you, what are those questions? I still do it to today. Like I do demo calls and onboarding calls and stuff. And I track this stuff and I give it to my team as like, here's data points. Here's what I'm hearing. Because that's the only way you can start to figure out what truly are. Because in our minds, we can believe it's this. But if no one's asking you about it, is it really a friction point in your business or is it just something that's a friction point for you? And that's where we have to start to decide some of that stuff. 
What what I like is that um, a you're writing it down. B you use some critical thinking to have uh, have the, the themes bubble up. But I think the most important is the attitude. So the attitude is, hey, if there is a theme here, I can fix it. There's no, like I'm, I'm sensing this. I hope mm -hmm. I'm not projecting too much, but I'm sensing that it's not just like, yeah, you know, it is what it is. Uh, it's always been that way. It sucks, but that's just the way it is. That's why I, that's how I spend a portion of my week. It, it's always going to be that way. And the, having the mindset that, no, if it's a problem, I can always get better. And there's always a solution to it. Then I think you're, you can scale. Well, I mean, I think that's what you we just you we have to do. Like that's what the podcast is about. Because just because we've always done it that way doesn't mean we always have to do it that way. And you can start taking these steps that lead us out of that. And there, there's just simple solutions to stuff. Like it does, it doesn't have to be super complicated to start being more effective in your business or getting rid of these friction points. And it, it all starts with understanding that there are friction points and then figuring out what they are with, like you said, the desire to change them, not to just like make a list and be like, well, that's what I thought it was going to be. We're just going to go into next Monday and it's going to be the same. I mean, you got guys like Paul out here that help with that stuff. So you, we have to have a mindset that we're going to win and win better every week. I like, I like the way you put that. It's uh, that mindset is, is key. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. So for all the champions that are listening, if they wanted to connect with you, follow you, do do whatever, where's the best places for them to do that? Well, we we have a link I, I can give, method.me slash construction champions, because that link has uh, some of the things I just talked about. I mean, I, I kind of breezed over it, but just like the step list, the, the list of like, how do you think about what, what, to automate what not to automate there's a seven step process you go through and that might be helpful awesome to people yeah that would be fantastic we would definitely have that in the show notes so thank you for that that are that helps provide some clarity for guys yeah so no problem thank you for being on the show today hey it was a lot of fun i really enjoyed it Awesome, man. I had a blast. I don't know about everybody else out there. They're probably thinking about their friction points right now. And they're like, damn, Sorry. These guys. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, once again, thank you for being on the show. Thanks for having me. All right, Construction Champions, another episode in the bay. Where, like we just said, we talked about friction points. We all have them. Let's just start being honest about it. Like maybe let's just start diving into them. I love when Paul said, you know, he said what we always hear is like, this is how it's always been. This is how I've done it. I'm just going to have to deal with it because why, why am I going to change this? You know, like what good could come from that? It would probably actually make things worse. Have you ever told yourself that? I know you probably have. Well, you're like, ah, you know, it's not the best, but if I mess with it, if the learning curve's going to happen and I'll probably make the whole situation worse, I'm just going to let you know that's BS. You need to go look in the mirror and have that conversation with you. It's like, is there going to be a learning curve? Yeah. Anytime you change anything in your business, there's a learning curve. But if you're doing something to make yourself, your company, your employees, everybody around you better at what they do and provide a better experience for everybody. Don't you think that's worth having a little bit of learning curve there to get to that, to get rid of that friction point? Like that, let's just say if whatever you change, it takes four weeks of a little bit more friction and a little bit more learning. But after those four, four weeks, that friction point goes away completely. Like, Let's think long-term here. Let's think opportunity cost. Let's not just think of like right now, what's happening, what is going to be the pain of it right now. And go take, take go to pause the site, the link that's in the notes and take a look at that. And then put your other like, some, what are you hearing? What are all these friction pain points that you're consistently hearing? 
you probably don't need me to tell you to go write them down because you probably during this episode have listed off three or five of them to yourself. That you're like, oh, it's this, it's that, and man, ah, oh, the last couple of weeks. Like you can start to change that stuff. Just pick one and change it. Pick another one and change it. It doesn't. I think we can get like we have to take care of everything all at once, and that's not the case. Like you can come in and you can fix a part of your business, make it better. And then the next time you go, when you fix something else, add another process or an automation in there, the next time it's going to be even easier. So construction champions, thank you for listening. Make sure you check out all the links in the the show notes. Check out all of our great sponsors that keep the show rocking and rolling. And until next time, be the champion you were meant to be. Introducing Buildercom's your comprehensive construction communication software. Simplify project management with unified communications, real-time picture and document sharing, and instant project notifications. Keep everyone in the loop and ensure client satisfaction. Experience the transformation in construction project management with Buildercom's. Start streamlining your projects and keeping clients ecstatic today. Say goodbye to misunderstandings and endless email digging. Say hello to more winning time. Choose Buildercom's, your gateway to construction project success.